each one of you here today. Stand with me as we go before the Lord in a word of prayer. But listen to what the Old Testament prophet writes. Here's a promise that God gives the prophet, who in turn gives it to the people of, uh, of Israel. And he says this, just to remind them who he is, right? So he says this, For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forevermore. It's a promise that God gives. Aren't you so glad God keeps his promises? Father, we give you thanks and praise for today. Thank you for allowing us to be together in your house today. We ask you, Lord, as we worship you, as we pray, as we hear about missions in our, in our local community, as we get into your word, Father, be glorified through everything that is said and done today. We thank you that your word says that you inhabit the praise of your people. So, Lord, we'll give you thanks. We'll give you praise, glory, and honor. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said... Amen. Let's worship him this morning. Hallelujah. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let us receive her King. Let every heart prepare Him room. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and nature sing. Savior reigns. Let all their songs employ. While fields and floods, rocks, hills, and plains repeat the sounding joy, repeat the sounding joy, repeat, repeat. The sounding joy, joy, unspeakable joy, an overflowing well, no tongue can tell, joy, unspeakable joy, it rises in my soul. Me go. He rules the world with truth and grace and makes the nations prove the glories of his righteousness and wonders of his love. And wonders of his love, and wonders, wonders of his love. Joy, unspeakable joy, an overflowing well, no tongue can tell. One more time, joy, unspeakable joy, joy, unspeakable joy, an overflowing well, no tongue can tell, joy, unspeakable joy, it rises in my soul. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We worship the newborn king. Amen. Hallelujah. He became sin who knew no sin that we might become his righteousness. He humbled himself and carried the cross. Love so amazing. Love so Jesus Messiah, name above all names, the blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, the rescue for sin. Some from heaven, Jesus Messiah, the Lord of all, His body, the bread, His blood, the wine, broken and poured out all for love. Trembled and the veil was torn. Love so amazing, love so amazing, Jesus Messiah. Emmanuel, 
He's the rescue for sinners, the ransom from heaven, Jesus Messiah, Lord of all, Jesus Messiah. take a moment and close your eyes. Would you take a moment and just raise your hands toward heaven and would you just worship him? He's worthy. It's Jesus Messiah. He's the Lord. He's our hope. He's our redeemer. He's Emmanuel, God with us. Just take a moment, church. Use your own words and just offer up praise to him this morning. He's worthy. Jesus Messiah, a name above all names, blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, the rescue for sinners. Some from heaven, Jesus Messiah, Lord of all. Sing it one more time, Jesus Messiah, He's the name above all names. Our blessed Redeemer, He's Emmanuel, the rescue for sinners. He's the ransom from heaven. He's Jesus Messiah. Hallelujah. One more time, just worship him, church. Just lift up a, a, a prayer offering. Just lift up a praise to his name this morning. Hallelujah. Jesus, we worship you. Jesus, we worship you. You're worthy, God. You're worthy. What child is this who laid to rest on Mary's lap is sleeping, whom angels greet with anthems sweet while shepherds watch our keeping. This, this. Christ our King, whom shepherds guard and angels sing. Haste, haste to bring him, Lord, the babe, the son of Mary. Why lies he in such mean a state where ox and ass are feeding? 
good Christian fear for sinners here. The silent word is pleading. Nail spear shall pierce him through. The cross be born for me, for you. Hail, hail the word made flesh, the babe, the son. So bring him incense, gold, and myrrh, come peasant king to own him, the king of kings salvation brings, let loving hearts enthrone him. Raise, raise. Song on high, the virgin sings her lullaby. Joy, joy, for Christ is born, the babe, the son of Mary. As we sing this chorus just the last time, we're just going to have the voices sing. And I just want to, you know, sometimes in Christmas, we get caught up with words. We get caught up in Christmas songs. But if you've ever taken the time to listen to the words that we're singing, there's some powerful words in these Christmas songs. Shame on us for not singing them all the time. You know, but society and culture says you can only sing those in December. Or you can only sing those after Thanksgiving or, you know, some of you leave your tree up all year round. No, I'm teasing. But we really should be worshiping Jesus with these songs because they're so good. They're so good. So let's just the voices. This, this is Christ the King. This, this is Christ the King. Whom shepherds guard and angels sing. Haste, haste to bring him, Lord, the babe, the son of man. Sing it again. Re. This, this is Christ the King. Whom shepherds guard and angels sing. Haste, haste to bring him, Lord, the babe, the son of Mary. Raise, raise the song on high. The virgin sings her lullaby. Joy, joy, for Christ is born, the babe, the son of Mary. Lord, we worship you this morning because you're worthy. You're worthy of all the praise and the glory and the honor. We can't even fathom love that would take and say, you know what, I'm going to send my son as the sacrifice. We, we can't comprehend it. We know it exists because we read it in your word. But Lord, to be able to fully comprehend it, we just can't in our carnal minds. And so, Father, help us. Help us to be open and to be sensitive to the moving of your spirit. Not just this morning in our service, but Lord, as we go through this week. As we go through next week, as the busyness of, our, of the year, of the season. But Father, help us to always be mindful of the King. Help us to be, always to be mindful of the sacrifice that was made as Jesus laid his glory down and came to this earth. 100% man and yet 100% God all at the same time. We remember this year. We remember this moment on that sacrifice that Jesus made sacrifice that God made in sending Jesus. And Father, we just thank you and we praise you for the tenderness of the moment, for the all and the wonder of that miraculous love that you have through the gift of the baby Jesus. So Father, we thank you and we praise you 
And we give you glory and we give you honor, God, for who you are because you're God. Lord, as we transition through the service, we, we think of those that can't be here today. There are many in our number that are sick and they are not feeling well. Father, right now in Jesus' name, maybe they're watching online, maybe they're just not even able to do that. Father, would you administer healing in their body in Jesus' name? Your word says that one of the reasons Jesus came and was born so that when he died, he could pay the price not only for the forgiveness of sin, but so that we could have healing in our body. And so, Father, we, we ask you, Lord, to heal those who are afflicted, those who are sick, those who are suffering right now in Jesus' name. Touch them, minister to them, their hearts, their physical bodies. Lord, just be so real to them in these moments. We think of others who, who are just going through different battles and different circumstances and different situations. Father, we lift them up to you this morning. We ask you, Lord, to touch them. We ask you to help them be, feel your peace and your joy and your love that we've been singing about this morning. But, Father, help them to feel it. Help them to sense it. Help them to experience it in such a tangible way. We think of our shut-ins, Lord, who just aren't able to get out a whole lot any longer. Lord, minister to them. And God will give you thanks and praise. Be with us and, and prepare our heart for the word as it comes forth in just a few moments. We ask you, Lord, that you would just do something new, something real, something fresh today, Father. So that as we leave this place, we recognize I am not the same individual leaving as I was when I came. And so, Father, we thank you. We praise you. We give you glory and we give you honor. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. amen. Take a moment, give the Lord a clap offering this morning. Say hi to someone, whether you turn around and wave or just give them a quick handshake and then you may be seated. It's so good to have you. Thank you for those of you that are joining us online this morning. If you're new today, whether it's online or in person, take one of the Connect cards. If you're in person, they're in the seat backs in front of you, and you can fill it out, turn it into Welcome Center. If you're joining us online, you can go to lifespringlitics.com, and at the top, press the Connect button, and they'll have an online version. You can take that, submit it. We'd love to connect with you this week. Uh, I'm so thankful that Erica from North Star is here today. And she is actually going to give us a presentation about the ministry of North Star. And so we're so thankful that she's able to be here. I just want to give two super quick announcements. Uh, ladies, you have uh, our Christmas Women's Connection coming up. Not this Tuesday the 7th, but next Tuesday the 14th. We'll have some information out to you in the email, uh, but we just want to remind you of that. Not this Tuesday, but next Tuesday, the 14th at 6.30 p.m. here at the church. And then men, the following Sunday, the 19th, is our, is our monthly men's ministry meeting. Sunday the 19th, that's two weeks from today at 4 o'clock here uh, at the church. So God bless you. Thanks for being here. And Erica, thank you for being here and sharing with us the ministry of North Star. Awesome. Thank you guys so much for having me here today. Um, so I just wanted to thank Life Spring Fellowship Church for having me to represent North Star Initiative this morning. I also know that I was here a couple months ago. You guys did a, did a drive for us for North Star. You guys collected some items. So thank you so much for that. Thank you for being partners with North Star. Um, we just really appreciate everybody who gives and supports our mission. So thank you so much. Um, as stated, my name is Erica Sensenag, and I am the administrative assistant for North Star. Um, for those of you who don't know, North Star Initiative is an organization located right here in Lidditz. Um, so we own and operate the Harbor Restoration Home for female survivors of domestic sex trafficking who are between the ages of 18 and 35. So this morning I would like to share one of our graduate stories with you. Um, this particular graduate, we'll call her Emma, um, graduated from North Star Initiative's restoration program in May of 2020, so over a year ago. Um, Emma came from an extreme situation. We do see this often, um, but hers was, was particularly extreme. Um, so she was trafficked by her family from childhood until her adult years. Emma was lucky enough to escape the life of trafficking that she was forced into, whereas a lot of survivors, or a lot of victims are not able to escape. So here's her story. My paternal grandfather was my main trafficker from the age of, of three until 13. I was adopted by my grandparents before my third birthday. When I first transitioned into their home before I was fully adopted, I tried to communicate what was happening, but there was no effective way to explain it. I was taken to the emergency room for fits for stomach aches and fits of screaming and crying out for my mother. 
Whenever I left the house with my papa, there was accompanying sexual abuse that I blocked out. I saw child psychologists and was diagnosed with separation anxiety and generalized night terrors. I did not know how to explain what was happening to me. I just believed I was having nightmares. Papa used an effective system of reward for the things that we did. He would take me to people's houses, let them abuse me, and then lavish such love and affection on me that I never even realized what he was doing was wrong. There were gifts and lots of food that he would use to reward me as well. And later, as a result, I developed severe substance abuse disorder and eating disorder and body dysmorphia. I thought I was making him proud when I pleased our clients. I thought I was making him prouder still when I pretended nothing had happened. I pretended so well I believed it myself. The most traumatic instances of rape occurred in my early childhood because I didn't know what was happening. I was so young and my papa was drugging me with GHB. For those of you who don't know, that's the date rape drug. To ensure compliance. I would wake up having no idea that anything had happened. There was evidence, physical bruising, soreness, and injury. But the true story didn't fit with the realm of possibility for me in that present moment. The level of abuse this afforded is unimaginable for someone who hasn't endured it. Around my fifth birthday, I tried to tell again and wasn't believed. He continued to traffic me until my grandmother divorced him when I was 13. As unbelievable as it may sound, I had a great childhood otherwise. It was easy for me to believe it was all just one bad nightmare and put it out of my mind as I grew older. There was so much denial in my worldview that it was easy for predators to find me. I was re-victimized as an adult. I was easy prey as I used drugs and alcohol to completely repress even the things that had happened to me as a young girl. Part of my appeal in trafficking circles was the fact that I had no idea what had happened and couldn't remember. I was easy to lure in and easy to dose even as an adult. Addicts are easy to drug and their stories are not believed if they ever catch on to what is happening to them. I genuinely did not know how to escape. The day my trafficker arranged to sell me to a new trafficker, I got up the courage to call my mom an AA sponsor. I didn't think they would believe me, but they did. I told them I had relapsed and needed a safe house to go to. My mother lived about 100 miles away, and thanks to an old friend, I was transported to the safe house in my mother's town that got me in touch with North Star Initiative. I had not had a drink or drug since that day when I left that town. For the first time in 20 years, I have been sober for 15 months. One of the greatest gifts that the harbor had given me was time and space. I needed a lot of time to forgive society and God. I was being affected by psychological programming that occurred in the early years of my trafficking when I was too young to have the words to describe what was happening to me. When my traffickers thought it was safe to do whatever they desired to me because they falsely believed I couldn't remember. The harbor gave me a quiet, safe space to process the truth about the abuse I was subjected to and how it framed my current worldview. The harbor gave me all the room I needed. They believed my truth when I didn't even believe it myself. They loved me until I could learn to love myself again. They were my strength before I knew I could become strong. They truly were my rock, the soil where I learned to give myself permission to plant roots and learn to trust God to water them again. I began to lose the fear of my sober consciousness there. I lost the fear of change and the fear of being alive all through the care and compassion the staff at North Star showed me. The opportunity to heal this program is the greatest gift I have ever been given. So we are happy to report today that Emma is happily reunited in another state with her husband and their two boys. She has a full-time job as a mentor in a rehabilitation center, which was once just her dream. It is beautiful to see survivors come to the harbor so broken, receive restoration and healing, and then choose to serve who are at the place serve those who were at the place that they once were at. Emma now has her dream job, is a wonderful wife and mother to her family, and still chooses to come back to the harbor on occasion to encourage the survivors we currently have at our program. These stories are made possible only through the grace and redemptive power of Jesus Christ. We always say whether we would just have one survivor at the harbor or a full house, we are still successful. Success to us is not the number of graduates we have from our program. It's about the one life that has been restored. We are frequently asked, how many girls do you have at the harbor? As if success is measured only by numbers. In our opinion, that logic is flawed. Matthew 18 talks about the value of saving the one, about the shepherd who seeks out the lost sheep, leaving the other 99 sheep behind. Matthew 18:13 says, and if he finds it, truly I tell you, he is happier about the one sheep 
that wandered off and about the 99 that did not wander off. This reasoning is unusual in today's society because we tend to value quantity over, qual quantity over quality, forgetting that our Savior Jesus Christ valued and still values each one of us. Survivor restoration can be a long, complex process, and each woman we work with has very different needs. Would the harbor be a success if only one life was restored from sex trafficking? Absolutely. I am honored to report that North Star Initiative has served many, many survivors in a variety of ways, providing them the support and tools they needed to take their next steps. But we would have gladly done the same amount of work for just one woman. Each survivor we encounter is worthy of the time, resources, and services needed to get back on her feet and onto a path towards sustained independence. But most of all, each survivor is worthy because she is a daughter of Jesus Christ. At North Star Initiative, we are committed to serving each one who enters our doors, knowing that no matter the time and effort, every life restored from sex trafficking is a resounding victory. We do it all for the one because she is worth it. If you're interested in learning more about how you can get involved with our ministry, I'm sure a lot of you saw I do have some materials in the back. I would love to talk to you about different volunteer opportunities, um, prayer requests that we have, needs that we have. Um, so if you want to connect with me, I would love to chat with you. So thank you so much for having me here this morning, and I hope to talk to you after the service. So thankful for the ministry of North Star. Lives being ch touched and transformed, right? And one at a time. One at a time. I, I love that. It's not about the quantity, but it's about the quality. And, and just the fact that, you know, God, God's in the transforming business. He really is. He's in the transforming your heart and life business. And he's in for each of these women that have been part of this ministry. We're so thankful. And we're so thankful that LifeSpring can part with them. So make sh partner with them. So make sure that you stop by the table. Um, I do want to mention to you, as many of you are aware, we are going to have a business meeting after our morning service. But we're going to take a bit of a break. And so we want to encourage you to use the restroom. But stop by the table and visit with them. Uh, they won't be sticking around during our meeting. So if you want to have an opportunity to connect, if you want to say hello, if you have some questions, make sure you take that opportunity. Uh, and ask them before they transition out and we transition into the meeting. So, but again, thank you for being here. Thank you for sharing the story. And thank you for being a part of that awesome ministry. Uh, the only other announcement I want to give to you is to let you know. Some of you have asked, and I can't believe it's December 5th and I haven't announced it yet. But we are having a Christmas Eve candlelight service uh, on December 24th. That is Christmas Eve, by the way. And uh, 7 o'clock here at the church. We'd love to have you come out and uh, be a part of that. We are jumping in, back in uh, this week, picking up where we left off last week, talking about Christmas foundations, the taking a look at some foundational biblical truths in the Christmas story. And uh, you can take out your Bible if you have one, the e-version or the tree version, and uh, you can turn with me to the Gospel of Luke chapter number one. Last week we talked about being biblically centered, and we took a look at the prophet Zim uh, Simeon, uh, and God had spoken, and I'm just going to take 30 seconds, I'm, I'm not going to re-preach that message by any means, but we talked about the fact that Simeon was biblically centered. In one of the darkest times of the church, 450 silent years that God was not speaking, what did Simeon do? He stood on the word of God. In the midst of chaos, in the midst of questions, in the midst of everything else, he knew God's law, he knew God's word, and he stood on it. Nothing could shake him from that. You can imagine, you know the times that we live in now, you hear all of the voices from culture, you hear all the voices that society is saying, and God this, and God's not that, and he's really not real, and all of that is great. You, you hear the voices those same voices were present in Simeon's time. Sometimes we, we think that the circumstances and the situations were different, but, but they were people. Simeon was able to stay anchored because he was biblically centered. Church, this is God's word. Th this is the Bible. This is what we stand on. This is what we live by. Not about news, not about culture, not about what the others are saying. Can I tell you, there's some nasty voices talking out there. 
There's some nasty voice. The, the message is nasty. It doesn't line up. And yet sometimes if we're not careful, we'll find ourselves being sucked into them. Anything contrary to God's word is not God's word. You and I need to be re- remained biblically centered, biblically anchored. Today we're talking about passionate worship. Passionate worship. Last week I talked about the mission of the church from Matthew 28. We talked about the behavior of the church, doing everything anchored in love. And we see God give us the perfect example of that through Jesus Christ. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. So in Luke chapter number 1, we take a look. And I'm going to read these verses very quickly. So if I'm going too fast, my apologies. But we're going to start in verse number 26 and read about the birth of Jesus being foretold to Mary. In the sixth month, God sent an angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, greetings, you who are highly favored, the Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Say favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I'm a virgin? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One will be born, who will be born, excuse me, the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age and she who was said to be barren is in her sixth month. For nothing is impossible with God. Say that with me. For nothing is impossible with God. One more time. For nothing is impossible with God. Another translation says this, and I absolutely love it. For no word from God will ever fail. Man, boy, if we could just get a hold of that. No word from God will ever fail. And Mary's response in verse number eight, I'm the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it be done to me as you had said, and the angel left her. May it be done to me as you have said, is her response to the angel, and then the angel leaves. Skipping over verses number 39 to 45, uh, uh, Mary goes and visits this uh, relative Elizabeth. When she arrives, the baby in Elizabeth's belly leaps because it's in the presence of the Savior. The baby in one womb leaps because of the baby in the other womb. There was a presence that Mary was carrying that affected those around her. There is a presence of the Holy Spirit that you carry that should affect the people around you. Mary walked into the room and the baby in Elizabeth's belly in her womb leaped. It moved. It jumped. Why? Because Jesus entered the room. Not in human form, in in, in like you and I standing and sitting here today, but in the womb of the virgin and the baby in Elizabeth's womb leaps. Because Jesus walked in the room. When you and I walk into the room, any room, name a room, any room, we carry the presence of the Holy Spirit. Stuff should change when Jesus comes in the room. And so, as the baby leaps in the womb for joy, Mary says in verse number 46, 
My soul glorifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has been mindful of his humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones. He has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, even as he said to our followers. This is Mary's song. If your Bible has little titles, sectional titles, that's what it says probably. Mary's song or Mary's praise. Mary was responding not only to what the angel had to say, but coming in to her cousin, coming into her relative, who then whose baby leaps in the womb when Mary walks in, and she is able to offer up this worship. Amidst the, uh, excuse me, amid the, the uncertain and life-threatening circumstances that Mary was, had the potential to face, she worshiped God. Sometimes I think we're guilty of reading the Bible like it's perfect. Now, the Bible is perfect, but life in Bible times was not. And so we see Mary as this almost, and we know she was a, a person, we know she was a woman, but we see her as almost like she was an angelic being. Once the Holy Spirit came upon her, she was able to conceive this child, there was maybe an angelic glow about her. Maybe she walked six or nine inches off of the ground on the air. Maybe life couldn't touch her because she was carrying the Most High. The reality is Mary knew exactly the consequences of what was transpiring. What do I mean by that? Mary's punishment, if you will, because of the law, because of the word, Mary's punishment should be to be stoned to death. That's what should have happened to Mary who was pregnant and did not have a husband. The law said, take her outside the walls of the city and stone her. Boy, that's not preached much in the Christmas story. But that's Mary's reality. We see Elizabeth, and I'm not going to go back and read it, but she hid for several months. We don't know much about the nine months that Mary was pregnant in terms of what happened and what her life was like, but I promise you it was not full of angelic choirs, it was not full of a radiant glow, and it was not walking several inches off the ground because she was carrying the most high child. Life was hard, but Mary understood as much as humanly possible that something miraculous was taking place. She worshipped God from within. She didn't worship God based upon her circumstances. She didn't worship God because she was pregnant. She didn't worship God because she loved Ju uh, Joseph so much. She worshipped God because there was something from within. How was she able, knowing that she could face death, knowing that she could be stoned to death. Have you ever thought about what that might be like? Ever thought about, what would it be like to be stoned to death? Some of you have been in some pretty horrific accidents. You've been in some pretty uh, 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 trauma situations where maybe you've been close to death or you've just been in extreme pain. You've been whatever you're, but to be stoned to death, have you ever thought about that? After the first pelt of the rock and then it just, I, I can't even fathom what that would be like, but again, that was Mary's reality of what could happen in this circumstance, and, but what do we see her doing? How is she responding? She's responding in an act of worship, 
There was something passionate about the worship. How could she do this? How, knowing that was, could be her fate, how could she do it? Because Mary, just like Simeon, was biblically centered. Because she had an understanding of the God that she served. She had an understanding that there was a bigger plan outside what she could comprehend. She believed God and that his word would never fail. She believed it so much that it changed her behavior and it changed her mindset. I, I said that last week too. When we're biblically centered, when we read God's word, when we allow it to come into our heart, it changes us. We're not the same people we used to be. I'm sorry, Emma. Was that the story? That was the name of... Emma was changed. Not just because she was rescued out of her situation, but because she allowed God to work a miracle in her life. You can't experience healing, true healing, total healing, without allowing God in to make some changes. And sometimes in that healing process, there's some pain as we deal with our emotions, as we deal with our minds and the mindset that we have. But God is not in the business of hurting us through healing. God's in the business of restoring us in our healing. And sometimes that process, there is pain, but through that pain, God restores. Through that restoration, we come to complete and total healing. Emma's a human being, and I'm sure she has her struggles, but I believe that Emma's not the same today as she was even two or three years ago. And I don't mean in her outward physical situation, I'm talking about the inside. Why? Because she had to get to the place where she knew, I can't do this. This is beyond me. This is bigger than I am. And it all starts right here. Yes, the reading is important. Yes, the the praying is important. We certainly don't want to diminish those things. But allowing it in and changing us is what it means to be biblically centered. And where we're biblically centered, it doesn't matter what happens, we can respond in an attitude of worship. What the one builds off of the other. We can't be passionate worshipers We're not biblically centered. Imagine this. Imagine with me a church where worship is an authentic, spirit-empowered expression for our love for Jesus shown in every aspect of our life. I'm going to say that again. Imagine a church where worship is an authentic, spirit-empowered expression of our love for Jesus shown or lived out in every aspect of life. Imagine what would happen if you and I, now listen, I say worship, you might be thinking of, thinking of songs. I'm not, th- I'm not talking about songs right now. I'm not talking about songs. Listen to what Colossians 3.17 says. And whatever you do, whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Whatever you do, do it for Jesus. That's worshiping. Singing songs is one small aspect of our worship. It's a great aspect, 
I certainly am not trying to diminish it, but it's just a piece. Worship is going to the job that God has blessed you with and letting the light of Christ shine there. That's worship. Worship is going to school, walking the halls there, and letting Christ shine. Worship is sitting in traffic, getting cut off, and not swearing because you're the only one in the car with the windows closed. Worship is what you do in public, and it's what you do in private. Worship is the thought that you think, it's the action that you do, it's the words that you say, it's the response that you give, it's the love that you show, it's the meal that you purchase. Worship is everything that you and I do because we should be doing it as unto the Lord. That's what the scripture says. Romans 12, 12 tells us to be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, and faithful in prayer. I mean, we could read here in the story after the angel departs that Mary just begins to offer this, God, why me? Why are you doing this to me? Why are you cursing me? Why are you punishing Why don't you love me, God? But that response is out of the flesh. That response is based upon circumstance. Mary loved Jesus. Mary loved God from the very inner part of who she was. And because she was biblically centered on God's word, she was able to be passionately worshiping him in the midst of her difficult circumstance. We look at Mary's response quickly to the news and as she begins her song, if you will, in verse number 46, she says, my soul glorifies the Lord, or some of your versions or translations say, my soul magnifies the Lord. Miriam Webster defines that word magnify as to increase in significance. To magnify something, you increase its significance. The original Greek word translate and says this, to make great and to make large. My soul magnifies the Lord. My soul it making, is, is, is making great the Lord despite my circumstance. My soul is lifting up the name of Jesus. My soul is bringing honor and glory to God so that his name might be revered. So that his name might be shown in the midst of my circumstance or my situation. My soul magnifies the Lord. And the response is, my spirit rejoices. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. I mentioned this earlier during the, our, our song service in John chapter number 4. Jesus is talking to the woman at the well. And he says, a time is coming and has now come when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth for they are the kind of worshipers the father seeks god is spirit and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth he was standing at the well not in the church he wasn't talking about the songs that we sing but the life that this woman was to live taking it in the context of john chapter number four when i say this woman because he's talking to a woman at the well God is looking for people who will worship Him in two aspects, in spirit. When you and I worship God in spirit, it's from the innermost place of who we are. It's our innermost being. It's, we're not worshiping Him in our mind. We're not worshiping because of how we feel about Him in our heart. We're worshiping Him because we know that we know that we know that He's God. Some of you can remember that moment when you said, Jesus, I need you. Come into my life. Come into my heart. Forgive me of my sin. Be my Lord and Savior. There was a drawing there. He was drawing you unto himself. He was saying, come. Come to me. I will give you rest. Come to me. I will give you forgiveness. Come to me. I will give you and whatever it is that you need. He was drawing you in. 
there's something when we begin to worship God because we know that we know that we know. It's like that luring in where he says, just come and worship me because I am that I am. I'm the Almighty. I'm the creator. I'm the maker. I'm real big and I'm over everything, but I'm also so personal. I'm also so real. I'm intimate with you. Worship me from that place. Because it doesn't matter what I go through. When I'm worshiping God from that place, all hell can be raging loose in my life. And I can still focus my attention on Him. Because my worship, when you and I worship Him passionately, when we worship Him from the innermost place, it's not based upon anything else than who He is. And when we're not worshiping from the when we're not worshiping him from that place, then our worship becomes circumstantial. I had a rough week, so I haven't spent much time with God. I had some bad news, so I can't go to God just yet. I hear people speaking things that I'm not really sure are true or not, so I'm going to sort things out before I go to God. We, we let these things keep us from God. That's not worshiping Him in spirit. And then he takes this other piece and he says, God is spirit. His worshipers must worship Him in spirit and in truth. He's God. This is truth. We worship Him knowing He's God, understanding He's the Creator, understanding that nothing has slipped off His radar, fallen through the cracks, or slipped out of His mind. I don't know if you're like you, some of you are, or I don't know if you're like me, uh, some of you are, but if I don't write it down, it doesn't get done. So, where's my cheat sheet? My wife this morning before service, Erica from North Star. Why? Because I was afraid I was going to forget her name from 1020 when I met her until I had to introduce her at 1050, right? If I don't write it down, shoop, somebody from North Star is here, you know? Like, I got to write it down. I'm okay with that. God doesn't have to write it down. Right? I was in a meeting the other day and somebody said something. I said, hold, stop, stop, don't say anything else. I want to get a pen and write it down because I don't want to forget it. Right? You're in the middle of praying, pouring out your heart. God's not saying, hold on. I never thought about that. Let me write it down. Because nothing slips off his radar. He's God. Worship him in spirit with everything that's inside of you heart, mind, soul, everything, and worship Him knowing He is truth. He's not even the truth. He is truth. He's the definition of truth. In verse number 48, Mary says something very interesting. For He, God has been mindful of my humble estate, or my humble state, excuse me, my humble state. He has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. That Greek word is epiblepo, and it means to look upon with favorable regard. God has looked upon me with fable, or excuse me, with favorable regard. God has looked upon me with favorable regard. Why? Because Mary was so awesome? I'm sure she was, but no, that's not why. He has been mindful of the humble state of of his servant. He has looked upon me with favorable regard. 
Why? Because the condition of Mary's heart. Because she loved God with all of her heart, soul, mind, and strength. Because she wasn't going to allow her situation or her circumstance or the fact that she was now pregnant and was not married to Joseph. She wasn't going to allow that. Listen, that news in the natural is enough to wreck, right? That would have wrecked her. In the natural, that would have wrecked us. But Mary had a position of knowing who God was. Mary had a position to understand. And it was because she was biblically centered, but Mary had the ability to understand that this was bigger than her. And all she had to do was keep her eyes fixed. And that's what allowed her when she came into Elizabeth's presence and, and, and the baby leaps in Elizabeth's womb to be able to worship God through this song. Because she recognized that God saw favorably. Listen, God sees you in a favorable regard. God sees you. If you are biblically centered, if you would allow this word or if you have allowed this word to just penetrate not just your mind but into your heart, into your spirit, into the very core of who you are, that I will follow God no matter what. If none go with me, I still will follow. It doesn't matter what others say. It doesn't matter what culture says. It doesn't. None of that matters. What matters is what God says. How you and I live our life, every aspect of it should be lining up with God's word. I don't want it to line up with others' opinions. I don't want it to line up with what feels good. I don't want it to line up with what's easy. I don't want it to line up with anything other than what God says. And guess what? God says that you will be persecuted for his name's sake. Guess what? God says that you will experience trouble. Guess what? God says that there will be some things that come that aren't going to be pleasant all the time. Sometimes we want our life to have that angelic glow. Sometimes we want our life to be the kind of life where we're walking six or nine inches off the ground without our feet touching. Sometimes we want our life like that. God says you can experience it, but it's not always going to be like that. But keep it centered and based on me. Worship God. Listen, passionate worship is cultivating a lifestyle where every thought, every word, and every action is an act of love to God. Passionate worship is cultivating a lifestyle where every thought, every action, and every word is an act of love to the Lord. So the question today is, you, are you and I living life, living a life of passionate worship? Is every thought that you think, every word that you speak, and every action that you make an act of love to the Lord? With the help of the Holy Spirit, we can do that when we allow God's word to come in. Imagine what would happen in the Big C Church. We won't even talk about Life Spring for a moment. What would happen in the Big C Church, the family of God, if the family of God, the word of God, just decided, you know what? No word of God will ever fail. And they just live life that way. Imagine how this world would be transformed. Now let's bring that in a little bit. What would happen in this body if we said, you know what, no word of God can fail and we'll live that way. Let's bring it in a little closer. What if you lived your life and said, you know what, no word from God can ever fail. And so I'm just going to live my life no matter, based upon God's word no matter what. Because if God said it, then I'm going to believe it. If God tells me to do it, then I'm going to do it. If he tells me not to do it, I'm not going to do it. If we just took God at his word and said, you know what? He can't fail. He won't fail. Failing is not an option. Can I tell you there's no plan B in the kingdom of God? This is plan A and it's going to come to fruition. This is it. Read the end. He wins. Are you and I living life like he wins? Because in the midst of my tough circumstances, I can still live like he wins. In the midst of bad news, I can still worship him because he's on the throne. 
in the midst of a wayward child or a lost job, I can still keep my eyes and say, God, you are my Jehovah Jireh. You are my provider. Maybe I did lose an income. Maybe I did, do have a child that's going the wrong path. But your God and your word says. So it might be a tough circumstance. There might be a tough moment. But God wins. And he says he'll never leave me or forsake me. Those aren't things that we say to make ourselves feel better, church. Those are things that we say because they're truth from God's word. Oh, I'm all alone. No, you're not. I'm a failure. No, you're not. If you're a child of God, if you've asked Jesus Christ to come into your life, to come into your heart, if you asked him to forgive you of your sin, if you are reading his word, praying, and you are doing everything that you can do to line yourself up with him and who he is, you are not anything that the word says you're not. And it doesn't matter. Everybody can call you something. But if that's not what God's word says, then you are not it. Stand with me as we get ready and close. I'm really not yelling at you. I get passionate about this. I get passionate about it. I know I raised my voice. I should probably not raise it so much. But I just, man. If we could just get a hold of this. And church, we can. Th this is not beyond our grasp. This is not beyond our ability. Oh, we can't do it on our own. I need the help of the Holy Spirit. I need the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. You need it. I need it. We need it as the body of Christ at LifeSpring. We need it as the big C church, the body of Christ. We need it. But we can do it with his help. And yeah, maybe, maybe you fall short one time. Maybe you mess up. Maybe you would. But we can ask God to forgive us in that. And he says that when we ask for forgiveness, that he cleanses us and removes it from us. And so we don't have to sit and lament and beat ourselves up for days and weeks and months. If God's forgiven us, then we can walk in that forgiveness. And we can continue to pursue him with everything that's inside in spirit and in truth. And he says, do everything, whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. So church, whatever you do, wherever you go, whatever you say, do it as unto Jesus. Well, I've, I've never thought about it that way before. Well, then good. Take some time this afternoon and meditate on that. Take some time this afternoon and say, God, what does that look like for me? God, I've maybe not been so good at that in the past. Maybe, maybe that's not a strength. Maybe you never thought about it that way. Maybe the Lord, as I was speaking this morning, just kind of dropped a, a nugget into your heart or into your mind or into your spirit. Then, then go home today and spend some time in, in prayer about that. Get into his word and read more about it as he, as he it continues to develop that in your heart. When I say amen and dismiss and, and we all go our, our separate ways whenever that is, when, when that happens, God's not done moving and he's going to pick up again next Sunday when we come back together. He, the Holy Spirit's going with you. That's how we can live a life of passionate worship. It's not just come in and worship passionately on Sunday morning because we can go in his favor and his grace and in his blessing because one the holy spirit is with us and with the help and the equipping and the empowerment of the holy spirit we can live life that way tonight and tomorrow and tuesday and wednesday and thursday and friday and saturday father today we just worship you with our words 
would you take a moment? We're all just going to pray out together in just a moment. But I just wanted you to take a moment and thank him. I asked you to do it during worship, during the song service this morning. But I want you to do it right now, in just a moment. And we're all going to talk out loud together. We're not listening to our neighbors or the people that are near us. We're just going to worship God out loud right now. 30 seconds. Would you just take and begin to, just begin to praise him, whatever's on your heart. Let, right now, let's, let's just begin to praise. Father, we thank you. We worship you. You're worthy of our praise and our glory and our honor. God, we want every aspect of our life to be bringing you glory and honor. Father, with our words and with our deed. Father, we want our thoughts and our words and our action to be an act of love to you, Father. Because worship isn't just songs on a Sunday morning. Worship, God, is not just songs on the radio when we're headed to work. Worship is how we live our life. Give us of the moments when we worship you based upon our circumstance. Forgive, forgive us of that, God, because even in the most bleak of earthly circumstances, you are worthy of our praise. We worship you this morning. Hallelujah. 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 Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. We worship you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God, we thank you that we can gather together. We thank you, Lord, that we can gather together as the body of Christ and we can worship you in song as we lift up a praise and a, and a shout and, and we sing the, the lyrics of these songs which are pointing us to you. God, we're thankful for that, but worship is so much more than a song. God, we want to live lives that passionately worship you where our thoughts and our words and our actions, every one of them, God is an act of love towards you. Would you help us with that? Would you help us to have an understanding, a simple and, and yet profound, but a simple understanding that your words won't fail. They can't fail. And so God, would you help us? If there's anything in our physical nature, in our earthly nature, that is fighting that. Father, would you bring that under submission? Would you help us, Father, through the help of the Spirit, the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, to push down the working of the flesh and allow the Spirit of God that dwells in us to shine bright? We know, Lord, because we've read the end of the book, you're victorious. So help our lives live that way. Help our lives shine that light of Christ. Lord, we thank you and we'll praise you. Be with us as we leave this place. And Father, we ask you, bless your people. Bless them in their going. Bless them in their coming. Bless them in their lives. Bless them in their workplace, in the school place. Father, everywhere they go, let the light of Christ shine in their lives. We'll give you thanks. We'll give you praise, we'll give you glory and honor, and we do it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Two quick things. Uh, thank you for those that continue to give. There's giving envelopes in the seat back in front of you. If you have a, a tithe or an offering, you can put it in there, put it in the uh, box that's in between the double set of doors, or give online. Make sure that you visit with Erica before you leave. We're going to take about 15-minute break. For those of you that are staying for the business meeting, we want to be able to, to uh, talk with Erica, see the North Star table, use the restroom, and then we will reconvene. God bless you. Thanks for being here today. You're dismissed.